Hello, Calc Kids. This is Mr. Bean. And today we're going to do indefinite integrals, which we already covered a little bit in our last lesson. We're just going to make sure we solidify our understanding of this. So to start us off, let's look at taking the derivative of these three functions really quick. So what's the derivative of each of these? Go ahead and write down what that is. And you should see that they're all exactly the same answer f prime of x equals 2x for all three of these. So they're all different functions, but yet they all have the same derivative. So when you ask the question, what is the antiderivative of 2x, there are lots of answers to that. It could be x squared plus 1, x squared minus 5, x squared plus 1,000, or an infinite number of other answers for the antiderivative, which leads us to different types of solutions that we could have. So when I say x squared plus c, that is what's called a general solution. The plus c represents any possible constant we could have, since the derivative of the constant is zero. So that's what's called, again, general solution. Now, if I have a specific number here, instead of a c, it actually is a very specific value, which in this case was the x squared plus one, then that one's called a particular solution. It's the particular solution that fits given, uh, given uh, criteria, which I will show you some examples of that as we work through this lesson today. So integrals that do not have any boundaries, these integrals without boundaries, those are called indefinite integrals as opposed to definite integrals. Definite integrals are the ones we've been working with where we are taking the area under the curve and we go from point A to point B. Those are definite. So today is indefinite and the solutions to indefinite integrals have this plus C. So they're in the form of a general solution. Okay, so let's do some examples. Exponential. We're going to start off with this really easy. Whatever the answer here is, the derivative of it would give us e to the x. That's how you do antiderivatives. If you take its derivative, does it give you what you started with, which is e to the x. So this one's pretty straightforward because it is just e to the x. Remember, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, so it's e to the x plus c. That's our general form. This one's a little bit trickier, and I should have... I forgot to put something on here. Uh, I should have some statement about what a is. A is, let's call it a, a is a, uh, a number greater than zero. Yeah, we don't want it to be negative for this exponential to work. So we are saying a to the x, its derivative. Now, off on the side of your notes, maybe on the left side, I'm going to write something down here, but don't do it down here. Maybe off on the left side. Let's just remind ourselves really quick, quick what is the derivative of a to the x? It is a to the x, and then you remember this, times the natural log of a. So if you were working backwards the other direction, how can you take the integral of a to the x? Like what, what in the world would that give you? So it has something to do with this. So this would be a point in the lesson if I was teaching you in class, I would make all of my students, hey, see what you can come up with. Do you think you've got it? Maybe check with each other. So it's a good chance for you to pause right now and just try and see if you can come up with it on your own. So try it first. And then here's the answer. So pause, pause, here we go. The answer is one over natural log of a, times a to the x, and then plus c for your general solution. Now, if you look at that part of it right here, this part, if you take its derivative, you would take its, the one over natural log of a is like a coefficient. So you just take the derivative of that, and then you'd see here the natural log of a's would cancel. And that's how you'd get back to this one. So let's find the general solution of this first one. So we just follow the pattern there. The answer to that is going to be one over the natural log of seven. So again, this is antiderivative, not derivative. That's when you have the one over if it's the antiderivative. And then times seven raised to the x, and then we have our plus c for the general solution. Here we're gonna do a particular solution. So this is the first time we've done this. So we take the antiderivative of this. So f of x, and we first write it in the general solution form. So the antiderivative of e to the x is itself e to the x minus, and then here we get two x to the add one, you get three, divided by three, and then we have to have our plus C for our general solution. Notice I'm writing small to leave myself some room. You want to do the same. Okay, so now we take what, instead of a general solution, we want the particular solution that fits this criteria where X is a zero and Y is a four. So Y is four and then X is zero. Minus that whole thing becomes a zero if X is zero plus C. And now we figure out what C value fits this criteria. So we have four equals one plus C subtract the one, you get three equals C. So now we can write out the answer. The, the particular solution is f of x is going to equal, so it's this line right here, e to the x minus two thirds x cubed. And now instead of a plus C, we write what C actually is, plus three. So this is our particular solution 
that fits the criteria that is the antiderivative of this, and then we figure out exactly which C it is that we're talking about by using the coordinate point, plugging in the points. That's how you get the particular solutions to these. Next up, we have logarithms as the answer. So we have here 1 over x. When you take the integral of 1 over x, you get the natural log of x. But we have to include this weird absolute value. I will talk about that in just a minute. But just as a rem reminder, when you take the derivative of the natural log of x, you remember that, you get 1 over x. So it would make sense if you're doing the antiderivative. Don't write this here, by the way. This was just a side note. If you do the antiderivative, you'd go back to natural log of x. Now, the, the qualifier here is that you, it must be absolute value around it. Because whatever your answer is, if you remember the logarithm graph, it does something like this where you have a vertical asymptote and you aren't going to have x values that are less than zero in a logarithm function. And so we have to put these absolute values around that. So just as a reminder, uh, usually this comes up in a multiple choice type problem and they'll have the absolute values in the multiple choice. So it makes it a little easier. And sometimes kids get confused on when to use the logarithm. So let me show you, if you tried the antiderivative power rule, like the inverse of the power rule, and we changed this to x to the negative one, and then you were to add one to it, you'd get x to the zero divided by zero. Well, you can't divide by zero. So hopefully if you were to just try that, you'd see there's a problem there and that would trigger a memory. Oh yeah, that's because this is just becomes the natural log, absolute value of x. That's when that one happens. And don't be confused. This is, <laughs> this is a very common mistake. When kids see this, one over x squared, they'll go straight to an answer and think, oh, that's the natural log of x squared plus c. No, it's not. Don't do that. Okay, don't do that. You only have this natural log when it's 1 over x to the first power. If it was 1 over x to the second power, then you do the normal things that we've been doing before with the this power rule thing. Okay, so let's take this example of this one. We have the antiderivative of 1, which is just x minus, and now that 5 can just be pulled out, and then it's like it's 1 over x, 5 times 1 over x, and then the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log of x with an absolute value there and then we add our constant c. Okay, and then that's it. So now let's do one with a particular solution instead of just a general solution. So I'm gonna have f of x is going to equal, so here I have two natural log, absolute value of x, and then plus, now what's gonna happen here? I'm, let me do some side work up here, six x to the negative two. If I add one, so it's gonna be x to the negative one, and then I would have to divide by negative one, or I could just change this little plus symbol to a minus, and then that'll save me that step. So instead of dividing by negative one, I change the plus to minus, and then I add my C. Okay, now we plug in the point one, negative seven. So negative seven is my Y, and then I'm gonna plug in one. And then from there, it's just simplifying, but you do have to remember that the natural log of one is zero. So that whole thing is a zero. And then you're just solving for C from there, and you get the C equals negative one. So now we can write what f of x is, and where do I get that from? It's this line right there, f of x is this, so that we just plug in what the c equals. So it's two natural log absolute value of x, and then this I can simplify to six over x, and then the c is a minus one, so I'll say minus one at the end. And there's our particular solution to this derivative. It's the function that goes through that point. Trig integrals. Now we're again with trig integrals, we're just going backwards from their derivatives. So we already covered these first two in our last lesson, which is sine x, the antiderivative of cosine x is sine x, the antiderivative of sine x is negative cosine x. So hopefully you can look at these and kind of remember, okay, what derivative do we take that gives us secant squared? That one's just tangent x. Oh, I forgot something important. Oops, sorry. Plus the constant, these have got to be general, plus c, plus c. I'll get that fixed on this one. So then on these, we have these answers. Cosecant cotangent is the derivative answer of negative cosecant x. Secant x tangent x is the derivative answer of secant x. So that, therefore you can go the other direction for the antiderivative. So if you don't have your trig derivatives memorized, this is hard. You have to have those down by now. And so uh, again, you wanna spend some time memorizing those if you don't have them yet. I will give you one hint, and that is for this the signs, whether it's negative or not. Remember when we take the derivative of a trig, if it starts with a C, then uh, you have a negative answer, right? If the derivative starts with a C for trig derivatives, then you have a negative answer. It's negative sine x. Well, if it's, a, if it's an integral, 
then it's if the answer starts with a C. So notice this, if the answer starts with a C, you have a negative answer. If the answer starts with a C, it's negative. Answer starts with a C, then it's negative. That's when they're negative, only when the answers are. So derivatives, if it's with you start with a C, integrals if your answer is a C. All right, so this one right here, three secant squared, that one's pretty straightforward. Secant squared is just the answer to a derivative problem of tangent x. So this is three tangent x plus some constant for our general solution. And now we'll do the particular solution. So we're gonna say y equals antiderivative of one is x, and then minus the antiderivative of sine is cosine, but since the answer starts with a c, we have to take the opposite sign. So now we'll make it a plus and then we add a constant. Okay, now I did not leave myself in a lot of room. Sorry about that. Now this pi minus two, that's the y value. So pi minus two equals the x is a pi. So we go pi plus cosine of pi plus a constant and then subtract the pi's. We get negative two, the pi's cancel. Cosine of pi is negative one plus c. Add the one over here, we get negative one equals c. All right, so now here's our answer, y equals y equals x plus cosine x, and then the plus c in this example is a minus one. So there is our particular solution for this scenario, antiderivative, and then you use this coordinate point to plug it in and find your c. Inverse trig derivatives are not that hard if you remember them. If you don't remember them, then yeah, there's no way you're getting these right. So just as a reminder, I have here the trig derivatives, not antiderivatives, but just the trig derivatives, and that is, Remember that if it starts with an S, so remember this, if it's, it's always gonna be one over, and then if it starts with an S, it's the square root and subtraction. So then we have, is it the one in front or the one behind? The sign, remember I like to think of that I as a, like a one to remind me that the one comes first, and then it's X squared. And then the secant, it also starts with an S, so I've got one over a square root symbol again and a subtraction. So it starts with an S, so I've got square root and subtraction, but the sign is the one with the one first. So this one, the one comes second. I put an X squared here and then, ah, crap. Ah, the C, ah, crap. I've got absolute value of X as well. I got to put that little absolute value thing on the bottom in the denominator. And then tangent does not start with an S. So we just go one over. So there's no S, it is addition, and there's no square root. So then we're going to have a one and an X squared, and it can go either way. It can go one plus X squared or X squared plus one. Addition is commutative, so the order does not matter. So there's our inverse trig derivatives. So going backwards, you just have to recognize it. Uh, one over this thing, what is that? Well, the one comes first, it's the square root. That one's gonna be sine inverse of x plus c, or just remember this is the same thing if you said arc sine. So arc sine of x plus c, those mean the same thing, sine inverse or arc sine. So this one, you got the absolute value of x, you got this x squared minus one, you just try to recognize them. It's easy right now, like I'm showing you this, and it's really easy, but if you had like two months from now and you're taking a practice exam and you saw this, it's, man, what do, can I remember that? Like, what is that going on? That's where the hard part comes in, is trying to remember way back here for this lesson. So this one's just secant inverse of x plus c, or we could write that as arc sine, not arc sine, arc secant of x plus c. Okay, last two problems and then we're all finished. These two problems are just strategies, algebra strategies actually, how to manipulate these before you take the integral. And when you get into higher calculus levels, like a calc a two and a calc three, you do a lot of this type of stuff with integrals. You try to manipulate this to make it something you can work with in an easier fashion. So this first one, you uh, you separate these rational functions. Each of these terms can be divided by x separately. So I'm going to write this as the integral of 3x squared over x plus x over x minus 2 over x. So if I can think of it this way and then simplify it, I end up with 3x plus 1 and then this one doesn't simplify, so it's just minus two over x. And now that is a ton easier to work with for an integral. So the, the antiderivative of this is just going to be three x squared over two, add one, divide by the same number, plus the antiderivative of one is x. And then here's where we have a logarithm because it's x to the first power on bottom. So minus two natural log of x, and then plus our constant for our general solution. So the idea for that is recognizing that you could separate each of these with your denominator before you have to 
to take the antiderivative, and it's much easier. So this one, this is another algebra type situation where I have, I'm going to take this 3x and distribute it through. So I have a 3x to the first power times x to the one half power plus 3x to the first power times x to the second power with respect to x. So now that is, I add exponents. So this just becomes 3x to the 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves. Plus 3x cubed, that one's easy with respect to x. Now we take the antiderivative. So I'll say 3x to the add 1 to that, you get 5 halves divided by 5 halves. Plus 3x to the add 1, you get 4 divided by 4, and then plus c. And then it's just a matter of cleaning this up a little bit. This 5 halves, I'm going to multiply by 2 fifths instead. So that becomes a 5 on bottom, x to the 5 halves plus a, well, I can just write 3 fourths, x to the fourth plus a c. Okay, so that's the trick with combining these expressions. When you have a square root, just think of it as x to the 1 half, and then you add the exponents. That's just a little algebra trick. Okay, we covered it all. So good luck on this, uh, this antiderivative stuff with indefinite integrals. Rock that master check, and I'll see you back in our next lesson.